The Second World War was a war on many fronts, from the steppes of Russia to the jungles of Southeast Asia. And despite the fact that the Third Reich had much of Europe in its iron grip, even in the darkest of times there were many brave acts by members of the resistance, from gathering intelligence to hiding Jewish families to acts of sabotage. There was resistance inside Germany itself, perhaps most famously Stauffenberg's Operation Valkyrie, but from the very start, even before the war started, there was resistance to the Nazi regime in Germany among Germany's youth, included among them the colorfully named Edelweiss Pirates. Because after all, don't all great stories involve pirates? The concept of adolescence, a period between childhood and adulthood, is actually a fairly modern concept that went hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution. Urban life, with parents often working and leaving children unattended, also separated older children as they often worked with little parental supervision, though they may still live at home. The roughness of urban life left many teenagers unruly and disillusioned, leading fairly directly to the formation of teenage gangs with their own rules of social conduct, separate from the world of both children and adults. The psychological concept of adolescence is relatively new, but troublemaking teens were just as prevalent in 1896 as they are today, and in Germany one of those answers was the German Youth Movement. In 1896, a German law student in Berlin organized a stenography class which involved walks around the community, and in 1897, a 15-day hike. It reflected a movement closely associated with 19th century concepts of romanticism, especially embracing nature, individualism, and freedom. The early groups, collectively referred to as wandering burg groups, also forced on a revival of Teutonic values and a focus on German nationalism. The groups helped to bring German folk songs back into society. First founded in 1901, at their height the movement had between 60 and 80,000 members. These groups weren't necessarily progressive. A number of them were anti-Jewish, for example. By 1913, a splinter group claimed that the purpose of the groups was to allow youth to discuss all their wishes and values without adult supervision. These movements were heavily influenced by the First World War. Leaders and soldiers returned with harrowing new experiences and a general distaste for war which influenced youth movements, as well as the beginning of German scouting. Youth groups began focusing more on hiking and outdoors activities, younger leadership, and education. These groups were immensely popular and reflected all the various responses to the growing Nazi movement within Germany. There were groups who supported it, especially the idea of a people's community, while others fell on the other end of the ideological spectrum. Many simply opposed the Nazis' desire for control over their activities, and which remained independent. In 1922, the Nazi Party established its own groups in this tradition, mainly as a kind of youth and training army for the Nazi Party's paramilitary SA, or Storm Detachment Group. Officially banned after the failed Nazi coup in 1923, the movements went underground. By 1924, the group renamed itself the Greater German Youth Movement, and in 1926 became the Hitler Youth, and formalized its relationship with the SA. These groups reflected some of the growing polarization in the country, which led to a number of youth movements founded mostly on the principles of ideology and politics, though in character they often still appear to be like other scouting organizations. By 1930, tens of thousands of boys aged 14 and older were part of the organization. A version for boys 10 to 14 was also founded, as well as a version for girls 1 to 18, the League of German Girls. For the Nazi party, one of the primary roles of the Hitler Youth was to indoctrinate the young with party ideology. So, while initially they copied many scouting activities, it slowly became a kind of paramilitary group meant to train young boys into soldiers, who could focus on weapons training and military discipline. As Hitler and the party took over the government, they systematically banned all forms of the youth movement not affiliated with the Nazi party. By 1939, membership in the Hitler Youth was compulsory, and groups not affiliated with the party were banned. The group counted around 8 million youth as members by 1940, as much as 90% of German youth. Youths faced extraordinary pressure from teachers, society, and their peers to join and participate in the youth. Non-conforming students were taunted by teachers as well as students, and they could even be denied a diploma, which would make it impossible to be admitted to a university. Some businesses denied apprenticeships and were not part of the youth. One young German wrote about the draw of the Nazi youth groups. There was something that drew us with mysterious power and swept us along. Close ranks of marching youth with banners waving, eyes fixed straight ahead, keeping time to a drumbeat and song. Was not this sense of fellowship overpowering? In the face of this pressure, many non-conforming students would simply drop out, which was legal at age 14, to avoid the subject entirely. The strictly regimented order and leadership of the Hitler Youth was chafing to many young people in Germany who sought greater freedom. 
By the late 1930s, in cities like Cologne, Dusseldorf, and Essen, these youths had begun to form their own rival countercultural groups, which became known as the Edelweiss Pirates. For the most part, the pirates weren't overtly political. In fact, they were a response to the hyper-political ideology of the Hitler Youth and a backlash against the control of the youth that was exerted by the Nazi government. They were also directly related to the previous German youth movement and adopted many of their symbols and styles of clothing and songs. These teenagers were usually the children of middle-class parents who may have disagreed with Nazi politics but largely kept their head down and did their work. It was common for working-class youths to drop out of school early and join their parents working in factories and other middle-class professions, but they took a very different view of the government's attempts to force them into conformity. They sang German folk songs like the youth groups of the past, but also popular music from out of the country and songs that were either by Jewish composers or anti-Nazi in sentiment. Some were perhaps even less political, and swing kids gathered mostly to listen to popular music like swing and jazz. These groups were never strictly controlled or officially affiliated, but all of them shared an identifiable common style, and many wore a kind of badge styled on the Edelweiss flower. They were predominantly male, but also attracted girls, mostly between the ages of 12 and 18. These groups met to discuss their own hopes, dreams, and their explicit rejection of the Nazis' demands for conformity. The groups liked to gather on street corners, not unlike youth gangs of London and New York, and also engaged in their own camping and hiking trips in defiance of restrictions on free movement, which kept them even further from the eyes of the government. The various groups were centered in urban areas and took their own names, but all considered themselves part of the larger pirate movement. Exact membership numbers aren't known. The Nazis kept records on hundreds, and experts have estimated that perhaps thousands, conservatively about 5% of the youth, were involved in one way or another in West Germany. One group who called themselves the Navajos and were centered in Cologne had something of a fight song. The force of Hitler makes us small. We still lie in chains. But one day we will be free again. We are about to break the chains. For our fists, they are hard. Yes, and the knives sit ready. For the freedom of the youth. Navajos fight. The pirates and the Hitler Youth were mutually antagonistic. Members of Hitler Youth Service patrols were allowed to commit crimes without fear of punishment, as the law restricted police from arresting them. The Hitler Youth often took advantage, attacking businesses, teachers, and often any pirates they could find. The pirates did not really make themselves difficult to find. Though they worked during the day at nights and in their free time, they wore bright clothing and scarves, wore their hair long, and often wore their metal Edelweiss pins with pride. The Gestapo would later compile lists of their fashions to better identify and arrest them. While many just wanted to be left alone and face constant attacks by members of the Hitler Youth, they didn't take the provocations sitting down. Instead, they gathered themselves and fought back, hunting down youth patrols in the streets and physically attacking them. One of their mottos was, Eternal War on the Hitler Youth. These attacks were effective. The Gestapo requested that police ensure that the pirates are dealt with once and for all. The Hitler Youth are taking their lives into their hands when they go out on the streets. While the early activities of the pirates may seem trivial, they represented a very present and real threat to the Nazi regime and were a persistent example of the ways that their vice grip on culture failed. Even the swing kids, almost specifically non-political, were written off with disgust by Nazi leaders, and Heinrich Himmler wanted to put the ringleaders into concentration camps, beaten and then put to hard labor. As the war carried on, the pirate groups began to ramp up their resistance activities. They began peppering walls with graffiti, writing things like, Down with Hitler, Medals for Murder, and No More Nazi Brutality. German reports said that pirates hang around in the evening with instruments and young females. Since this riffraff is in large part outside the Hitler Youth, they represent a danger to other young people. And that they hate all discipline and therefore place themselves in opposition to the community. However, they are not only politically hostile, but as a result of their composition are also criminal and antisocial. In December 1942, the Gestapo initiated a crackdown on the pirates. 739 were arrested in a single night, and many of them were sent to re-education camps. By 1942, Cologne and the surrounding area were frequently targeted by Allied bombing raids, which sought to wear down morale on the German home front. Along with the millions of pounds of ordnance, countless leaflets were dumped on the region. Pirates continued their activities, perhaps even more easily in the war-swept region, and stuffed these Allied propaganda pamphlets into letterboxes to make them more likely to be seen. They began to work with larger resistance movements and played pranks, like filling military cars' gas tanks with sugar or tossing bricks through government building windows. More benignly, many simply committed crimes such as theft and vandalism and listened to the BBC. Some of the members began sheltering escaped prisoners and Wehrmacht deserters, stealing supplies and even participating in armed attacks and supplying resistance groups with explosives. 
Their activities were often unplanned. One member recalled that they would hang around a pool hall until someone asked what next. Perhaps one mentioned that the Hitler Youth was storing their equipment at such and such place. Let's make it disappear. We started maybe by deflating tires. Then we would make the whole bicycle disappear, Pirate Walter Meyer reported years later. Meyer was eventually arrested for stealing shoes from a bombed out store. He remembers the prosecutor pushed for the death penalty. But fortunately, he was only sent to prison. Another member, Gertrude Koch, helped found the Cologne Pirates and remembers bringing food to a Jewish man her family was hiding. She also let a leaflet drop from the roof of the clone train station, for which she was arrested and jailed for nine months. Lesser punishments included shaving their heads, a common means of humiliation at the time. In 1944, 15-year-old Jan Ulick was arrested in Cologne. He was imprisoned and tortured for months. He was actually one of the lucky ones. The district of Ehrenfeld in Cologne was bombed out enough to provide considerable cover for escaped prisoners and resistance and fighters. And in 1943, Hans Steinbuck escaped from a concentration camp to hide in the area. He stockpiled weapons and foodstuffs. He worked with local resistance network and became known as Black Hans. A number of young people, including members of the Pirates, saw the 23-year-old Hans as a leader. Together, the Ehrenfeld group acquired guns. They financed themselves by stealing things like butter, which could be sold for a huge amount on the black market. Around this time, a leading Nazi member of the Gestapo in Cologne was also murdered. In September of 1944, the Nazis learned of the cellar where the group was storing their goods, but Hans was able to escape. Joining up with others, they went on a Nazi hunt and killed several in sporadic shooting across the city. By October 15th, the Gestapo had arrested Hans and 63 others, including 19 teenagers. On November 10th, Hans and 12 others were hanged without trial in Cologne, including six teenagers, many current or former members of the Pirates. They were accused of planning to blow up the Gestapo headquarters in Cologne, which Walter Meyer said was, in fact, part of their plan. Since World War II, the role of the Edelweiss pirates has become something controversial. Some saw them as an act of resistance to the Nazis. Fritz Thieland, who was one of the pirates and wrote a memoir in 1984, has actually argued several court cases defending that version, once saying, I never thought I would have to justify myself. But others argue that they were merely disaffected youth who were causing trouble. And matter of fact, some of them continued to cause trouble for the Allies, who had to deal with them after the end of the war. They point to several acts of theft or vandalism that seem to have little to do with actual resistance, and comments from many of the pirates said that they were really more interested in personal freedom than any sort of political ideals. In 1998, the Israeli Holocaust Memorial, the Yad Vashem, honored the Edelweiss pirates as righteous among the nations. In 2005, a movie about the pirates was released, and surviving members were presented with the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. Pirate Gertrude Koch said, we were from the working class, and that's the main reason that we weren't recognized until today. After the war, there were no judges in Germany, and so the old Nazi judges were used, and they upheld the criminalization of what we did and who we were. But a line from one of their songs memorializes their contribution. We marched by the banks of the Ruhr and Rhine, and smashed the Hitler Youth in twain. Our song is freedom, love, and life. We are the pirates of Edelweiss. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. And I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>